Well, amen. Good morning, church. Come on. Well, first of all, you can be turning your Bibles to Genesis chapter 14. First of all, I want to take a moment just to thank all the leaders in our church. I want to thank Papa Pat and Mama Pam for taking care of all of us, for always looking out. And uh, Tracy and I have appreciated you guys and the way you look out for us and everyone in the church here. Pat and Sparkle, uh, you guys have built such an amazing sector. The Vine City sector here, yeah? You guys have done a phenomenal, phenomenal job. Miguel, just the way you, you gather the brothers and sisters, the way you lead our singles has been a phenomenal thing to watch. I want to thank you for your leadership. RD and April, you are such incredibly healing friends. You've helped Tracy and I through so much since we've been here, and we love you guys. Corey and G. Corey, you become one of my best friends. And it is so hard to watch you go. But um, you guys built a church that is capable of sending out two mission teams at one time. You will be coming back to speak many times. But think about that, guys. We're sending out the Chicago Supplemental Team. We're sending out the Dubai Mission Team. What an incredible, incredible thing that you get to witness happen at this time for this very hour. I also want to thank our uh, mother and father in the faith, Kip and Elena McKean, for their leadership. Thank you for your training and your vision and your faith. There's nothing like the kingdom of God. If you're visiting today, I pray that you've seen something different already. I pray you didn't need this lesson to see something different. What a phenomenal family that we have here in this room. And yet we do need to have a lesson. The title of the lesson is A Son of God. Genesis chapter 14. You know, I've noticed something in the last few weeks. I've noticed that uh, oftentimes disciples get quiet when we talk about being close to God. When we talk about having great quiet times. When we talk about reaching out to the lost world. And yet, I think I understand a little bit why that happens. See, as disciples, we get admonished a lot. You know what I'm talking about? We get corrected a lot. Why? Because we're not Jesus. <laughs> and yet, in the middle of giving corrections, receiving corrections, and, you know, if you're a little bit like me, sometimes you're a little stubborn and hard-headed and need some rebukes. In the middle of all that stuff, it's so easy to forget that we're saved. It's so easy to lose our gratitude for salvation. And yet, when we lose that, we lose everything. We become a shell of a person. And the way you know you've fallen into that trap is that you get quiet when we talk about being close to God. I'll do a little exercise here. Most of you know where I'm going with this. Raise your hand if you're saved today. Tell me how you really feel about that. I mean, how do you feel about being saved? It's like winning the lottery. There's 8 billion people on the planet, and God chose you. And yet I want to talk about our Lord and Savior today, Jesus, a son of God. I want you to think about how great he is. Now, you know, in order to really understand how great he is, we've got to talk about how great some men in the Bible are. Uh, in Genesis 14... We know Abraham is the father of our faith. What a phenomenally great man. Went to save his nephew when he drifted away. Just a few men defeating many. And yet, I want you to consider Melchizedek here. In Genesis 14, verse 17, the Bible reads, 
After Abram returned from defeating Kalodomor, the kings allied with him, and the king of Sodom came out to meet him in the valley of Shiva. That is the king's valley. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. It's the first communion in the Bible. He was priest of God Most High and blessed Abraham, saying, Blessed be Abraham by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who delivered your enemies into your hand. Then Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. Abraham had no problem with contribution there, I see. <laughs> and, and yet, to bless someone, the greater blesses the lesser. Abraham was the lesser. We looked to him as the example for our faith, and, and yet he was blessed by someone greater in Melchizedek. And, and the way Abraham viewed him was that he took communion to Melchizedek. He gave his contribution to Melchizedek. Hop on over to Hebrews chapter 7. Let's compare that to Jesus. Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 1. This Melchizedek was king of Salem and priest of God most high. He met Abraham returning from the defeat of the kings and blessed him, and Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. So let's just check out how awesome this Melchizedek guy is. First, his name means king of righteousness. Well, that's pretty awesome. Then also king of Salem, which means king of peace. That's pretty awesome too. Without father or mother, without genealogy, wait a minute. He was immaculately conceived like Jesus. Without genealogy, without beginning of days or end of life, like the son of man, he remains a priest forever. Just think how great he was. Wow. That's a pretty awesome dude. You know, we, we come into the kingdom of God, which is a phenomenal place. There's nothing like it. And, and we have these phenomenal people thrust into our lives who we look up to and we think are incredible. I mean, isn't Pat Bouye Sr. an incredible man? We have an RD thrust into our lives, a Kip, a Corey. Uh, Miguel, I mean, uh, Pat Jr., I mean, it's just all these phenomenal people that we take for granted all the time that are so incredible, and yet not one is Jesus. Our first point is that Jesus is the Son of God. Go to John chapter 1. So just how great is Jesus compared to us, compared to the greatest amongst us? In John chapter 1 and verse 47, when Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said to him, well, here's a true Israelite in whom nothing is false. So we know Nathanael's not going to tell a lie here about who Jesus is. How do you know me, Nathanael said. Well, Jesus answered, well, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the son of God, the king of Israel. The Son of God. That's pretty awesome. You know, he was there when this planet was formed. He heard the words, let there be light, and watched it happen. You know how he watched it happen? He made it happen. That's how awesome he is. Go to chapter 5, verse 24. I tell you the truth. Whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. Now that's pretty awesome. Any of you get condemned at work this week? Condemned by a family member? Condemned by someone on the street? Maybe you cut them off and they condemned you with their hand? When you believe in Jesus, which is obviously followed by the action of following Jesus, you don't get condemned. It says, he has crossed over from death to life. I tell you the truth, the time is coming and has now come when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. That can be you today. For as the Father has life in himself... 
So he has granted the Son to have life in himself, and he has given him authority to judge because uh, he's just the Son of Man. Jesus is the man. You know, Jesus Christ was the most incredible being man has ever come in contact with. The full measure of the spirit. What did that look like? Nothing is impossible for him. No problem too great. No hardship can harm him or take away his spirit. Not a shred of doubt or fear or insecurity at all. Wow. The highest level of integrity. He didn't even come close to being deceitful in the slightest way or embellishing. He didn't have to. A divine confidence coupled with the most irresistible humility. Words like thunder that just gathered like joyful noise. Rebukes that just penetrate to the dividing soul and spirit joints and just to the deepest reaches of your soul. No one could go deeper than Jesus. And yet every word always healed and built up. He always knew exactly what to say, exactly what to do, and exactly when to do it. He didn't just have like coffee table discipling. You know what I'm talking about? That kind of discipling time or counseling time when you, you sit and you just talk about all the problems you haven't repented of? Where the leader plays therapist or psychologist? That was not Jesus. That was, he was too great for that. He had what we're calling a high efficiency modular D times. Where he took his disciples out with him. See, he had his plan for what he was doing to impact this world, and he took his disciples with him. He didn't just go to them and carve out a time just for them to just cry and moan and gripe and, and, and walk away discouraged because they haven't changed yet. He took them with him to change the world. He took them with him to serve and, and, and to give to people. He took them with him to, to have outreach Okay, he'd send them out two by two, but then he gathered them back with him to help them because they were so beat up after being alone in the world. He, he, he went with them to rest and to pray. Jesus was phenomenal. He's the perfect example for all of us. And yet, if you're a real, true, baptized disciple today, you've been made in his image because of all the work of all these leaders I spoke about today. Is that not phenomenal? Yeah. I remember when I became a disciple in 1993, came full circle from completely losing my faith. When I was a child, I had great faith. I loved God. I loved his word. We grew up in a Baptist church, and um, they, we didn't have kingdom kids. We had Sunday school. And I'd go to Sunday school, and I went to a little program called Awana. And, and in Awana, you had this nice little red vest. It's kind of like a Boy Scout vest. And every time you memorized a, pin, a uh, scripture, you'd get a little pin to put on your vest. And uh, I remember my, my vest was just shredded with pins. I love the Word of God. I love memorizing His Word. I still have my first Bible that my mom gave me, the little picture Bible. It's pretty awesome. Sometimes I get more out of the picture Bible than the regular ones. At times. <laughs> but... You know, then uh, I got baptized at five years old. How about that? I didn't know what I was doing. I just got wet. <laughs> I remember coming out of the baptismal, looking at everybody. Ah, I wanted attention, you know. It, it, but, I, but I loved God so much until I walked in the back and caught the pastor messing around with the secretary. Whoa, what, what was that all about? Started to lose my faith. And then I had a very similar incident. Uh, I, I, you know, Kenneth did a great job sharing today. Thank you. Thank you for your, your testimony. I had a very similar incident what Kenneth described. You know, my mother being beaten. And uh, I tried to stop it. And I got grabbed by the throat and thrown into a glass, uh, glass, uh, sliding glass door. 
And uh, I couldn't stop it, so I ran out of the house bleeding, cut from the glass and everything, and I ran a mile down the street to the pastor's house. By this time, it was a different church. And, and it, I see it as clear as day. Just open the door and just whoosh, the smell of alcohol. His nose all pink and slurring, and he's no use to anybody. And I lost my faith that day. I let man get in between me and God. You know, oftentimes we cry about what happened to us, but we've got to learn to cry about our response to what happened to us. Because that's what takes away our relationship with God. And so I went from 12 years old to 23 years old, faithless, wild, angry, bitter, enraged, always. I especially hated Christians, and I especially hated the leaders. And yet one day, I found the church. I found the kingdom of God. And of course, God knew what I needed. The leaders were all awesome and charismatic, but I was like, yeah, mm -hmm. And so he used just your average regular people to get me. What impacted me was the zeal in their voices, the look in their eyes, the passion and intensity of their singing, the love in their hugs, even though I rejected it at first. First guy that hugged me, I grabbed him by his throat, kind of like, I was kind of like that guy with Kenneth, I said, don't ever touch me again. And yet it broke me. It broke my pride, it broke my anger. Why did I lose my faith? Because I never saw anyone talk like Jesus. I never saw anybody love like Jesus, walk like him, teach like him, speak like him. I only saw faults. And I didn't have the ability to look past faults to see godliness in people. I lost my faith that man, in the heart of mankind, they want an awesome, incredible world to live in and to be a part of a family of God. But Jesus, you can't do that with him. He's perfect in every way. He's the embodiment of the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning, the end, everything. He's the King of Kings. He's the Lord of Lords. And he's your Savior and mine. He is not an institution. He's the living embodiment of what it means to be family, and that is what you are a part of here today. Yeah. Jesus is the Son of God. Secondly, you are a Son of God. Go to Galatians chapter 3. We so often forget that we are made in His image. We get so focused on the imperfections and the What's not like Jesus that we, we forget that we're made in his image. In Galatians 3, verse 26. You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. I just want you to picture that for a moment. I'll look pretty good today. Got your suits. You know, at some point I'll get my little, my little handkerchief like Chris Bryant. It's pretty cool. I got to imitate a little bit. You put Christ on. It's not who you are, but it's who you strive for. Don't you dress to fit the situation? You go to work, you dress a little bit more like the people at work, don't you? You go, to, you go play ball, you don't wear a suit. You, you dress for the occasion. You dress to become like who you're around. And yet, if you're a part of God's kingdom, you're around Jesus. And so you put him on to look like him. It says, there is no Jew or Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you're Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Just because you're not the son of God doesn't mean you aren't a son of God. 
And you should walk high with your head held high, proud of that name that you bear. One chapter over to Galatians 4, verse 3. You know I'm building up to ask you to do something great, right? Galatians 4, verse 3. So also, when we were children, we were in slavery under the basic principles of this world. But when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those under law, that we might receive the full rights of sons. You have the same rights as Jesus. Because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into your hearts. The spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you're no longer a slave, but a son. And since you are a son, God has also made you an heir to his kingdom. You know, Devin, uh, my son Devin is 17 years old. Thank God he looks like Tracy. But he looks like Tracy because he's our, what, our son. Now, Dylan, our younger one, he thinks and reasons and loves like me and Tracy. Why? Because he's our son. You know, Jesus wasn't God's only son or daughter. He looks exactly like God. He talks exactly like God. And yet you are a son of God. You are a daughter of God. And he calls you to walk like him and talk like him and be like him today. Now we know how great Jesus was. We know who he was. And yet, I want you to take a moment to think about how great he made you to be today. You have a calling that is far higher than you can imagine. Eight billion people in the world, and you're the one sitting here today. He said, of all these billions of people in this world, I chose you first. Because I know what you can do, he says. I know who I made you to be. You're in my, you were created in my image to be like me. And you cannot be like God without changing this world. Go to 1 Peter chapter 2. First Peter chapter 2. You were not meant to just survive. You were not meant to only persevere. You were not meant to hide out in your community or your school or your job. You were meant to stand out like a shining light. Like a light that's so bright people can hardly look at it. In First Peter 2 verse 9, this is who you are. But you are a chosen people. Give yourselves a round of applause for that. A royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, but not just so that you can be happy. That's part of it. That's where it starts, but so that you can declare the praises of him who called you out of the darkness into this wonderful light. The same way you sing with all your heart in here is the same way you preach God's word out in the public. Corey and Gia built a phenomenal foundation here. There's no reason this room should not be packed every single week from what we've been given. What a phenomenal thing to be chosen. I don't think it sinks in what it means to be royalty, to be a prince, a princess. All you sisters, you're God's little princesses. You're to be treated like that. You're to carry yourself like that. All the horrific things that have happened to you, he wipes away. You don't have to wait for heaven for your tears to be wiped away. You can wipe them away now. His image. We have secret things that people don't know about. You know, you know what one of the greatest things that we have that people don't know about? The ability to forgive. Who's hurt you? Who's damaged you? Sticks and stones. But words, what? That's a bunch of garbage. I mean, they don't have to, but we let it, don't we? 
Because we forget who we are. I mean, you think about the Queen of England. If somebody says, oh, you're some little poor, you think she's, whatever. I mean, why do we have to be hurt? You're a son of God. You're a daughter of God. Nobody can take that from you. I think we just, we get too overcritical of ourselves and others. It's one of the greatest reasons we forget. Probably the only flaw you had this week that was really worth thinking about is whether you gave your all or not. All you can be asked to do is give your best and then be open to correction on how to be even better like a coach. It's really all you can be asked to do. The problem is you don't know how much that really is that you can do. You can do far more than you're doing right now, I guarantee you. How do I know? Well, you know, AJ and CL just had a baby recently, right? Well, he's doing all that he does around the sound and the audio and mercy and all this stuff, and he's raising a baby on top of it, which he wasn't doing before. He can do far more than he thought he could. <laughs> Having a child is the thing that really exposes in us how much more is inside of us. It's one of the most special things in the world, but it, it tells us more about ourselves than almost anything else. It's that way having physical babies, it's that way having spiritual babies. But you know, in the kingdom, royalty equals servant. We wash feet, we serve one another, we lay down our lives, and we do it of our own accord. No one telling us to, because we walk like Jesus. You know, I learned a while back just to do my best and to be proud of doing my best and to be led to better. And, you know, it's interesting when we're converted. Uh, in our Bible talk, we had, a, we had an incredible sister named Lisa who was converted not too long ago. And uh, Lisa was met by Julie, who does the communion. And, and uh, it was phenomenal watching, watching Lisa study. Uh, because she, she's a great mom. She takes great care of her kids in the evenings and stuff. And so she'd come at 7 a.m. every morning to study the Bible. It's a phenomenal thing. And, uh, and yet, the thing that struck me most is, uh, you know, Lisa's in the back over there. She still carries the invite in her purse that Julie gave her the day she invited her. And yet, she'd been separated from her husband for four years. And, uh, you know, things weren't very good there. And, and yet she learned a secret thing when she became a disciple, and that's how to forgive someone. Amen. And so she forgave him. Amen. And then, you know, a doggone thing happened. Just a couple weeks later, Reuben just shows on up at church. Yeah. And he just comes on in, and he's sitting in the back. <laughs> he just claimed that seat. He's still sitting in the same seat right now today. <laughs> But it was so exciting because as he came week after week, you know, uh, all the brothers would go to the back and where he was at and, and reach out to him. And, and yet he began to be convinced that his life could change forever. He began to become convinced through the brothers and God's word that his wife had actually forgiven him. Their marriage could work. And he began to be inspired to study the Bible. He studied the Bible with uh, Jermaine and I and... About three weeks later, yeah. Reuben got baptized and became a brother in Christ. <laughs> and a few weeks ago, we were studying the Bible, you know, and you just don't really realize how much impact God makes on somebody and yeah. until you see them in a Bible study trying to help somebody else have their life changed. Yeah. And we're sitting down in this Bible study, and and there were some guys we were studying with, a very similar background, and, and, and Jermaine and I are really trying to get in there with them, and we're just like, <laughs> brick wall, you know? And then uh, Reuben goes, hey, I understand what you're going through. And, and he starts laying out his life and all that changed. And they were having a hard time with, you know, not being able to read and understand. And, and he says, you know, I have the same problem. I listen to the Bible on my phone. I do what it takes to get it, God's word into my heart. And that guy he was talking to got baptized four days later.
We don't realize it. But disciple equals leader. Because Jesus equals leader. And so Reuben led that guy in just one conversation toward baptism. Where two other disciples that have been around 15 and 23 years couldn't make a dent. That's the impact you can have on somebody's life. You lead people to church because you're royalty. You have what they don't have. You have secret answers. You have great convictions that put you in that seat every single week. You know, it's an interesting thing. Because of Jesus, in the first century, they took up a special collect every year for the needs of the churches. And we do that every year. And yet that's coming up in a couple of weeks. And yet it's an amazing thing. Because of Jesus' leadership, they were not only faithful in giving each week, the Bible says, they also gave beyond that for that mission. And they sold their possessions for that mission. And then the Bible says they even gave beyond their ability. That means you find money you don't have, which we call fundraising. And yet, the most incredible thing about it is because of what Jesus did in their life, the Bible says that they urgently pleaded if they could partake in doing that. Here goes the quiet thing again. Amen. Amen. It's kind of minister helping congregation here, you know. The Bible says they begged for the honor of giving. You know, I may ask, how are you here today? You know, uh, Kip got baptized in 1972, right? Yeah. And, 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 you know, Elena got baptized in 1973, this next year. And, and yet, they instituted in our movement of churches doing this annual giving. And for me, I've been a disciple for 23 years, Corey, what, 25, 25 years. And yet, uh, every year we've given this special collect. And it's an amazing thing. Every year, we empty our bank account out to nothing, and we give our special collect. And you know what's in my mind and my heart when I do that? You. That's it. 23 years ago, I began giving. I had I spent $50,000 on my car stereo system. I was a part of the world. And it was the loudest vehicle in the country in 1992. And I got baptized and I go, this is just stupid. And so I ripped all that stuff out of my truck and I sold it for $30,000 and I gave the whole thing for special collect that year. Myself and countless other disciples have done that every year, and that's the only reason you guys have a place to be sitting here today. Let it not be about anything else other than that, that we raise money fervishly to meet the needs of a lost world and the needs of our churches around the world. You being here is the answer to your own question about where the money goes. If you want to know where it goes, with in regards to me, I got $101 in the bank and $1,200 in bills. That's where the money goes. And the $1,200 isn't paid yet, so, you know, the money goes just a regular salary. See, you got to understand something about being a son of God or a daughter of God. Being a disciple fulfills every childhood dream I ever had about making a difference in this world. Being a doctor doesn't do it. Being a firefighter doesn't do it. Being a... Pro basketball player doesn't do it. That was great, but Corey being a disciple and a preacher is what does it. You are a son of God. You are a daughter of God, and you are royalty today. Thirdly, you calm storms. Go to Matthew chapter 14. Because you are made in the image of God, you calm storms. Matthew 14, verse 25. During the fourth watch of the night, that was pretty late, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. I don't know about you, that freaked me out. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. Freaked them out too. It's a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. But you know the story. Jesus walked out on water. He rebuked the winds and the waves, and what happened? 
That's your prayer life right there if you want it to be. What winds and waves you got going in your life? What winds and waves are going on in your family's lives and the people around you that God's connected you with? He created you as the leader out of billions of people and put you around who you're around so you can calm the storms in their life by giving them God's word. When I went in the ministry, I used to think that people listened because of the title of evangelist or leader. And then I learned something. Most people are scarred by leadership, so there's actually more disrespect because of the title. I learned what to embrace is just being a disciple of Jesus, and what changes people is when you give them God's word. Faith in God's word and obedience to what it says always fixes everything, eventually. (laughs) Y'all put the eventually in because it doesn't happen when you want. But that's when leadership becomes powerful. When you realize there is no storm that you cannot calm with God's word and obedience to it. You are a son of God who calms storms. Lastly, you help the blind to see. Mark chapter 8. We'll bring it to a close here. Mark chapter 8 verse 22. You help the blind to see. They came to Bethsaida, and some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. Now check this out. Here's a, this is a nice ministry technique. It says, when he had spit on his eyes and put his hands on him, Jesus asked him, do you see anything? <laughs> Let me just put something in your eyes. Now do you see? That is nasty. I mean, you just like, that, this passage invo- invokes so much emotion. <laughs> Spitting and putting your hands on somebody and, okay, now do you see? You know, we have this crazy expectation. It's the one we should have, but our response kind of kills it at times. We expect because I read you the Bible, you should get it now. And we get so mad at each other. But I told you what to do. Why aren't you doing it? And the other person's thinking, the same reason you're not doing the things you're not doing. And yet, here's what happens oftentimes when we read the word of God to each other. See, this is why the thing about perseverance is in the scriptures. So the dude has spit in his eyes. And he's like, okay, do I see anything? He goes, Ugh. He looked up and he said, oh, I see people. They look like trees walking around. It's all blurry. You ever had that? You read the Bible to somebody? I've had many talks like that with Kip. You read the Bible to me? I think, I kind of, no, I don't get it. It says, once more, Jesus put his hands on the man. See, that's the key right there. That's the key. See, most of us, we just kind of (sighs) go, you didn't get it, whatever. No, you got to, again. You got to do it again. See, once he did it again, then the guy's eyes were open and his sight was restored. And he saw everything clearly. Then Jesus sent him home saying, don't go into the village. Every single person that God put in your life is blind in one way or another. And just like Jesus spit in their eyes, you've got to do whatever it takes to get God's word into their heart. That's really the whole point of it. Don't spit on anybody, please. Ron told me to spit on you. It's not going to work. It's just going to make problems. But whatever you do and try to get God's word into people's hearts, don't give up. Keep trying. We need each other. That's why there's the concept of brother or sister. Jesus never gave up on you, and you were at your worst. And we've got to stop giving up on each other. Amen? Our last scripture, John chapter 14. We'll close out with this one. Knowing what you know about Jesus, 
Even if all you know is this is your very first time ever being in a church and this is all you've ever heard, knowing what you know from just what we've read today, how can this room stay half empty? How can it? Think about it. Who needs this? Does anybody not need it? Let's go get them. John chapter 14. Here comes the challenge part. The thing I'm going to ask you to do. John chapter 14 and verse 12. Anybody? Raise your hand if you got faith in Jesus. Let's just kind of test it and make it real here. All right. So... You have faith in Jesus, right? Yeah. So now I'm going to issue the challenge. I tell you the truth. Anyone who has faith in me, that's Jesus talking, right? Will do what I've been doing. <laughs> walking, serving, walking on water, dying, rebuking, raising the dead. All the things we complain about. But here's the real challenge. He'll do even greater things than these because I'm going to the Father. And, what, and I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. The challenge today, very simple. Evangelize the world in this generation. Find every lost soul, bring them in this room, and find the open ones and get them converted. Can you do that? Yeah. Will you do that? Yeah. Every week. Yeah. Of course, I want you to think about Jesus and how great he was. But I especially want you to think about how great he made you to be. All your dreams, all your goals, all your ambitions, all you ever wanted in life is exactly what God wants you to do. But doing it like Jesus. So it changes this world forever. Join me today as we evangelize this city and do our part of evangelizing these nations and our generations. I love you all very much. Have a great day.